Okay. <clears throat> yeah, we'll give folks a, a few seconds to join in. So starting our our Facebook Live event. All right. And if I feel like I'm looking off, it's because that's my notes, sir. Gotcha. Yeah, it's not. You're not distracted? I'm not distracted. I'm trying to stay on track. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, but I have two o'clock. All right. So uh Welcome to the Brain Injury Association of America's uh, Facebook Live event. Uh, just a couple of notes before we start. Certainly, if you have questions at all throughout uh, today's conversation, you can use the comments section on Facebook to post them. If we don't have time to get to your questions, we will follow up with you after the conversation today. As always, you can contact our Brain Injury Information Center at 1-800-444-6443. Also to ask questions and to talk to a specialist. Today's uh, conversation is about PBA or pseudobulbar affect. Uh, it's an often overlooked issue following brain injury. We thought it'd be good to share some information, uh, some resources that BI has developed to help people with PBA and their families. I'm Greg Ayotte. I'm the Director of Consumer Services for the Brain Injury Association of America. I manage the Brain Injury Information Center. And with us today, we're very happy to have our esteemed uh, medical director for BIAA, Dr. Brent Maisel. Um, Brent is the Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs with the Center for Neuroskills and is a clinical professor of neurology at the University of Texas medical branch in Galveston. He has uh, worn many hats in his years. He is a board certified neurologist, was in private practice in neurology for 16 years, also was the medical director for the Transitional Learning Center in Galveston for years. Uh, he has uh, discussed, researched, and uh, presented about the chronic issues around brain injury many times. Um, we are very happy to have you here today. Thank you, Dr. Mazel, for joining us. Thank you. Delighted. So I guess we can jump right in with the with the basics of it. Can you explain a little bit about what PBA is? Well, PBA, uh, pseudobulbar palsy, is a, um, it's a disinhibition syndrome. It's called pseudo uh, because the original thought behind this was this, there were similar symptoms for people from uh, who had ALS. And the ALS is a, a problem with the... the uh, uh, the part of the bra uh, the brainstem, the bulb. And so it sort of got that name. It's really mm -hmm. not a good name, but that's what yeah. it is. And, yeah. and that's and that's what we're stuck with because we don't only see it just in ALS. We see it in uh, traumatic brain injury. We see it in stroke. We see it in uh, multiple sclerosis. see it in brain tumors, people with uh, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's. I see a fair number of folks in my clinic at UTMB with dementia and see a, see a, a significant amount of uh, uh, PB, uh, uh, pseudobulbar affect in, in my clinic with those patients with dementia. It's a dis... Uh-oh. Seems to have lost Dr. Maisel. Uh-oh. Man, I'm not sure what happened. If we, if he's going to be able to come back or not, so we'll wait for a moment. Um, so, as we have learned so far, to recap, pseudobulbar affect, it's a disinhibition syndrome. It can be present in a variety of neurological injury, from brain injury to stroke to tumor to MS. And he was talking about seeing some of his clients from uh, dementia. There he is. There we go. I, I just yes. logged out and logged back in. There we go. Okay. I, I didn't touch anything. I didn't do a thing. That wasn't me. Must have been yes. the dog. Yes, clearly. Clearly. Excellent. Well, anyway, we're, uh, we're as I was saying to... before I was so rudely interrupted, very happy um, to have you back. It's a it's a disinhibition syndrome. In that, uh, I think the, the best example is the baby crying. Babies don't always cry because they're happy or sad. They cry because they have no control over their 
crying and laughing. I mean, within reason, obviously. And there are pathways that are, help us monitor that kind of kind of thing. And you hear of somebody, you know, when they're drunk, they're they're mm -hmm. disinhibited, right? Okay, and the pathways aren't working. The, the pathways that control and inhibit some of those activities and actions and stupid things that we do just aren't working right because we've had, say, in the situation too much alcohol. And in, with pseudobulbar affect, it's sort of kind of the same kind of thing where we don't have control. And and the, the, the classic is pathological laughing and crying. Uh, and it's it's inappropriate response to something happy or sad. If my wife would say to me, well, gee, you know, the so-and-so is canceled tonight. We can't go out to dinner. I go, oh, well, you know, that's too bad. But if I had PBA, I might just start bawling, just, just start crying. Or if she said, you know, hey, it looks like the weather's going to be nice today. And so I saying, great, I just start laughing and get very excited. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of thing. And the problem is um, it's not well recognized. The, the yeah. statistics are anywhere from 2 million to 7 million in the United States. So that's quite and, a range. Yeah. 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 And and that's because it's not, it's not well documented because it's right. not well recognized. Mm -hmm. um, so even if we just say somewhere in the middle, 3 million, 4 million, it's still a lot, yeah. but yeah. most physicians don't know about it. Neurologists certainly do. And the rehab docs do, but other people, you know, the family medicine docs and the internal medicine doctors, they're really not aware of this. So very often um, it's uh, it's diagnosed as, say, schizophrenia or diagnosed as depression, uh, and they don't really recognize what the issue is. And I understand it's a it, it's 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 a little hard to get your hands around it unless you're really aware of it, unless you know about it. Some of the things that I've read. <clears throat> too, that I think can be challenging, just like many other things in, with brain injury, is this is a, a condition that can present, you know, either early on after a brain injury or years after. It's not, you know, so it's one of those things that can crop up a few years after the the original injury, which I think sometimes can make the diagnosis challenging because you're out in the community and you're going to your primary care doc to talk about it. Well, what... Um... I just came from the Brain Injury Association board meeting yesterday, and the big push for the coming year will to will be to get that information out to the to everybody involved in brain injury that brain injury isn't a static issue. It's not you have your brain injury and you know it's not a broken bone and you put it in the cast and three months you're fine. It's the beginning of a, of a chronic problem, and we see things develop years later, and sometimes. It, we, we forget to connect those dots. And right. so I'm not at all surprised that it may develop years later. In fact, I would be surprised if it did. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and I think one thing you touched on too was that, um, and it's hard, I think, for families to wrap their heads around is that the, the behavior, right? So the laughing or crying is not necessarily connected to an underlying emotion. Um, and so it's, can be kind of confusing for the family member, not only to understand why they're doing this, but also how to react to it, right? Your natural reaction when someone is crying is feel like, oh, how can I help you? How can I feel better? You want to try to kind of calm them, but that might not be what's going on underneath the behavior at all. And it can be very confusing for the families to understand this issue as well. Right. And, and the best thing they can, you know, I get, I get, questions from families. So how do I deal with this and how I deal yeah. with that? And frequently my answer is you're with your loved one all day long. I'm with them for you know 20 minutes here. Um, and it's one of those, you, you sort of give them tips, but ultimately the family needs to figure that out and they'll mm -hmm. try this and they'll try that. And eventually they'll come up with something very often redirecting the patient. You know, they start crying and you you say, you know, well, look, let's look at this, or you take them outside or something just to redirect them. Very often that helps. Um, a lot of times, sometimes the patients know, they know that this is happening and, and just mm -hmm. can't tell, and it's very frustrating for them. Right. Uh, yeah. So reassurance that this is, you know, this is not anything they did and reassurance to the family that 
because dinner was canceled last, uh, tonight, that's the, the patient isn't really that unhappy. So do the episodes tend to be long lasting? Are they kind of like, I mean, to me, I was explained it as someone explained to me is kind of like this seizure event. Like if you're not really sure when it's happening and it, you know, it lasts for a few moments, but then can go away and you're kind of left with the, with the aftermath of it. But I don't, is that an accurate description that the events are usually pretty short in duration? Yes. They're very, they're very, they're short in duration. They could be 15 seconds. Um, <laughs> And that and that helps the family. And you know, by by the time the family realizes what's going on and yeah, it has their call to action, the episode is over, and the patient very often are, are okay. I mean, they're they're upset that they did this, but you know, they're not sad or, or laughing. And there's unlike a seizure, there's not really an aura to this. At least my understanding, right? It's not a you don't know, feel. Some people can that feel like a seizure coming on. In these cases. Not, that's not really the the experience. Just kind of, just kind of happens. It it happens um, usually in response to something, some, you know, something, um, but not always. <clears throat> but again, it's very it's short. So, what are some of the tips you can offer to the uh, person with the injury or the family thinks they might have this? What are some things that they might do to help that conversation with their primary care doc, with their whoever, uh, to kind of at least get the medical doctor to be uh, open to this as a as a possibility. Well, the, the average internist, the average family medicine doctor, really has little knowledge about brain injury. And that's not to berate them and put them down. It's just no, they've got is. so much they need to know they can't know everything. And so, like I said, I'm not surprised if they're not aware of this issue. And um, there's nothing wrong with you going, the, the family's going to Dr. Google and printing something <laughs> out and say, hey, I've looked at, looked at, looked at his symptoms and they, they fit with this. And can you refer him to a neurologist or a rehab doc uh, who, is, who understands brain injury? And, and that I, I if if the family doesn't recognize it, yeah. If the doctor doesn't recognize it, and the family does, the doctor needs educating, and a good physician will be okay with that. We can't know everything, yes. so I think the the first step would be to to educate them. Um, I see a lot of people um, with hormonal dysfunction, and the same. Mm -hmm. I think most doctors don't realize after brain injury, most doctors don't know. And I say, here, here's some articles, give them to your doctor so that your doctor now will understand what the problem is. And then once the patient has been, uh, once it's been identified, probably the best thing is to refer, again, refer them to a doctor who understands this issue because there are, there are treatments available. So are there types of doctors that are more, uh, familiar with this? Um, neurologists should be aware of this uh, because it's, again, it's not just limited to brain injury. Not all <laughs> neurologists know uh, brain injury, but we see it in the, in the spectrum of illnesses that we're comfortable with. Um, and the rehab docs, okay. if, if they are, um, because some rehab doctors will specialize in musculoskeletal issues and right, right, may right. not be aware of this. But if it's a, a rehab doc who is familiar with brain injury, they should know about it as well. Okay. Um, and so I'll put a little plug in too for our, uh, <clears throat> our, the Brain Injury Association of America work to develop a website. It's uh, pbavoices.org. Um, and on that site, information about PBA, there's a quiz you can take. There's the, I'm blanking on the name of the scale. The CNS uh, scale is there. You could print that out and share it with your medical provider. There's a little advocacy toolkit. You can also print out with more information about kind of talking with your doctor, explaining it to families. So that could be a useful uh, tool as well. So you can visit that in um and download the the uh, self advocacy toolkit as well as get some information to share with family and friends. Are there um, any um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Any, uh, uh, not contraindicate, any, any, uh, like what I'm trying to th think of is brain injury doesn't happen in a bubble, right? So there are other, uh, if you're seeing these type of uh, behaviors, are there other things you might also consider in addition to PBA or is it, Kind of, nah, I think it's BBA. Or we'll start with that and see if, if it's not that, then we kind of roll down to the what else it might be. Well, it can be a, it should be a symptom of something else. <clears throat> okay. You just don't have, I guess, you don't have PBA in a vacuum, if you will. Right. So, right. It's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 there's another, yeah. there's a disease causing the PBA, which is a symptom of the disease. And Generally speaking, somebody should know that there's should know the disease. But if the presenting symptoms are this pathologic laughing and crying, and they are they are immediately ought to be referred to a neurologist or probably a neurologist if, if that's the only symptom they have because they need to be evaluated. And the thing I advise the the family members and caregivers is don't be afraid to advocate for your mm -hmm. loved one. Don't 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 allow the system to roll over you stand stand at the door you know and stand at the door and don't let the doctor out till the doctor's answered your question <laughs> and, the, and the one other tip i have is when you go visit the doctor and the doctor starts explaining what the you know, what the issues are and the plan is hit record on your telephone because you're not going yeah. to remember you are not you are several you are several sentences behind <laughs> I have been a patient and I know they're talking and I'm still several sentences behind trying to grasp what that means for me. So hit the record button. And then when, then when you get home, you play it. And sometimes you hear something significantly different than what you thought you heard. That's a great suggestion. Yes. Cause you're very often right. You are definitely running behind with that. And you're not processing the info that's being presented. So you're going to miss a bunch of stuff. So yeah, being able to review that info later can be very helpful, right? right. Whether it's record, whether it's have somebody there kind of having them repeat it and taking notes, however it might be to make sure you have that information to review later and think through about what, what do I need to do next? What are the next steps that can definitely be helpful? Yeah. I tell, I tell the patients and their families all the time. I said, hit record. And then when you go home and they say, well, what did the doctor say? You press, you play, and then they listen to it. And then when they say, well, what else did he say? You say, he said goodbye. And that's it. <laughs> you got the whole conversation the same way as whoever went to the, to the office did. Well, I appreciate you coming on and kind of sharing a little bit of your uh, expertise around PBA with us and giving some helpful tips. Um, as you had mentioned, it's definitely... Uh, an issue that is often uh, overlooked or uh, misdiagnosed, which felt it was important to kind of have these events to try to share and increase the awareness and understanding of it. Um, again, my plug, you can go to the pbavoices.org website for information. You can also contact our Brain Injury Information Center at 1-800-444-6443 to talk to a brain injury specialist for information as well. And I, I would also point out there are medicines available for this. So oh, yes. That's yeah, it's not something that, you know, it's like there's nothing we can do. There are medicines that, that help. Yes, definitely. All right. Well, again, thank you, Brent, for coming on and sharing your expertise. Please feel free to contact us if you have questions. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a safe day.